，你好。啊 b o n j o u r n o 你好，你叫什么名字啊？啊？啊 ，C C。呃，不不不不，你的名字是什么？啊？哦 ，Miss g o o s y m i s s g o o s y 哎呀，哎呀，算了吧。What's your bloody name, mate? Ah, my name, Mikiamo Matteo. G'day, everyone. My name is Stephen, and welcome to another episode of the Bamboo History Podcast. For those of you who are new, the Bamboo History Podcast is a podcast that talks about Chinese and East Asian history. If this type of content is up your alley, please subscribe to my podcast right now. And follow my Instagram at Bamboo History Podcast, where you can find episode descriptions, teasers, and also additional historical content that aren't podcast episodes. All right, let's just get straight into it. Today, we're going to talk about a famous Italian person who travelled and lived in ancient China. And before all of you start saying, "Oh yeah, I know who that is," no, no. It's not Marco Bloody Polo that we're going to talk about today, and technically Marco Polo wasn't Italian; he was Venetian. That's a story for another day. So, the person we are going to talk about today is the famous Italian, not Marco Polo, but his name is Matteo Ricci. Matteo Ricci, spelt M A T T E O R I C C I. Was one of the most famous Jesuit priests that visited China during the medieval period. His Chinese name is Li Ma Do, which was actually a Chinese name he gave himself. And he was born in the year 1552 in the city of Maserata, M A C E R A T A, which at the time was under the rule of the Papal States, but in modern times it's part of the country Italy. Let's talk about Matteo Ricci's early life first. So Matteo was born into a really well-off and noble family. His dad was a pharmacist, and his parents ran a pharmacy. When Matteo Ricci was born, during his time, Italy was in the Renaissance period. If you don't know what the Renaissance period is, this was a period in time in Europe where there was a blow-up in arts, culture. Language, science, and exploration. This was the period of time where we saw people like Leonardo da Vinci and Galileo Galileo Galileo. This also coincided with the power and influence of the Catholic Church, especially in the Papal States where Matteo Ricci was born, because the Papal States were ruled directly by the Pope. Hence, for a young, curious Matteo. He was drawn in to learning the knowledge that was being spread during the Renaissance, and he also was curious and wanted to learn more about the Catholic faith. As a child, Matteo studied at a school opened by Jesuit priests, but his father had high hopes for him. He wanted his son to get a good, respectable job and earn lots of money, and he didn't want his son to associate himself with the religion and the church too much. So his father planned the perfect career path for his son, lawyer. His father sent him to Rome to study law, because his father was like, "I don't want my son to study, you know, religion and be a bloody priest and all that. He needs to get a proper job. He needs to earn money and get a wife and find a family." But young Matteo was just not interested in law. He just loved religion and he wanted to be a Catholic priest. So when he was nineteen, he defied his father's wishes, and he joined the Society of Jesus while he was in college, and at the same time he ditched his law studies. And surprise, surprise, the college he was studying at in Rome was called Roman College. And by joining the Society of Jesus, Matteo Ricci began his life as a religious figure. You're probably all wondering what is the Society of Jesus. I'll just take a brief detour. 
The Society of Jesus is actually colloquially known as the Jesuits. Jesuit spelt J-E-S-U-I-T. The Jesuits were founded by a man named Saint Ignatius of Loyola in the year 1540, and it is a Catholic religious order. What separates the Jesuits from other Catholic religious orders is that they are committed to seek God and find God's will in all things, which has led to Jesuits studying a wide array of topics like maths and science, and travelling to different places around the world just to seek knowledge. And unlike other Catholic orders, the Jesuits are also expected to take up orders and go anywhere in the world to conduct the work of God. Now back to Matteo's story. After he became a Jesuit, Matteo began studying at college earnestly. Instead of getting wasted, you know, at frat parties and all that, he studied really hard in college, and he learnt a wealth of knowledge in the fields of mathematics, cosmology, astronomy, philosophy, and obviously, theology. In the year 1577, when he was 25, he applied for a trip of a lifetime to go to Asia and China as a missionary. He left Europe, and then, for the next few years, he didn't go to China straight away. He spent a few years teaching, training, and studying in the Portuguese colony of Goa in India. Then, in the year 1582, he set sail to China, arriving first at Macau, which at the time was a Portuguese trading outpost and the gateway to China. So I imagine a young Mateo setting foot in Macau and East Asia for the first time. I wonder what he would have felt when he first set foot in China. You see, it was going to be a huge challenge to convert Chinese people into Christianity. That was the task Mateo Ricci was given as a Jesuit priest. There are so many reasons why converting Chinese people during that period of time would have been really hard. I mean, first off, China is a huge country at the time with a lot of people. China at the time had never even heard of Christianity. They were probably like, what the hell is that? And Chinese people back then had their own set of religious beliefs and philosophical ideologies that they firmly believed in. The biggest example was Confucianism. And to make things worse for people like Matteo, China was also closed off and suspicious towards foreigners at the time. It was owed to the fact that the Chinese people back then thought that they were number one in the world, that they were the centre of the world, and that no one else could possibly be better than them. So with that kind of mindset, it would have been really hard for foreigners to stay in China, let alone spread a religion completely unknown to them. It was basically a near impossible task. How was Matteo then, and the other missionaries, going to convert Chinese people to Christianity? Well, as soon as he landed in Macau, Matteo decided to learn the local Chinese language. He spent a year learning the language, and this was super important, because he had to learn the language. Because if you didn't learn the language, how would you be able to make friends with Chinese people and build a rapport with them? By building rapport, rapport would allow you to build relationships, and by creating relationships with Chinese people, that would be the first step into creating understanding and possibly, possibly open the door for Matteo to start converting them into Christianity. But Macau was like the base camp of Everest, because it was a Portuguese trading post, so there was still some European influence there. So Macau was easy mode for Matteo. The real test was to enter actual China, which at the time was the Ming Dynasty, Ming spelt M-I-N-G. So a year after arriving in Macau in the year 1582, Matteo's first exposure to real China was in the city of Zhaoqing. Zhaoqing spelt Z-H-A-O-Q-I-N-G. Zhaoqing is a city in southern China. And when he went there, he had a partner with him. He wasn't completely alone. His partner was another Jesuit priest whose name was Michael Ruggieri. Ruggieri spelt R-U-G-G-I-E-R-I. 
Rigieri's Chinese name was Luo Mingjian. Rigieri was more experienced than Matteo Ricci. He was older than Matteo. In fact, the reason that the both of them were even allowed to stay in the city of Zhao Qing was the fact that Rigieri had already built some rapport with the local officials there, who decided to let them stay. When they were in Zhao Qing, it was actually really funny. Let me explain. Imagine if you're a local in the city of Zhao Qing, then all of a sudden you see two Buddhist monks just walking around the street. Now, Buddhism in China was a thing, so seeing Buddhist monks at the time probably wasn't a huge surprise. But what was funny was that these Buddhist monks were white people. <laughs> it would have been very strange, like two bold white guys wearing Chinese robes that were Buddhist robes just walking around. <laughs> if I was a kid, I would have been laughing my ass off. <laughs> and you know why they did that? Because they thought that was the way they were going to convert people into Christianity, which I find very ironic because they're wearing Buddhist monk clothing. You see, they were applying what they thought worked in Europe, in China. In Europe, monks were held in high regard, and they were highly respected. So they thought Chinese monks would also be held in high status. So that's why they dressed up in Buddhist robes. But it turned out, just because something works in Europe, doesn't mean it's going to work in China. In fact, there's a lot of things that work in Europe that don't work in China, and vice versa. And the biggest reason was, Buddhist monks in China actually had low status. So they must have been walking around trying to convert people to Christianity in Buddhist clothing. It might have gotten a laugh or two, but it didn't work. And they quickly realised they needed to change strategy. They soon found out that it wasn't the Buddhist monks in China that were held in high esteem. It was actually the Confucian scholars that were the most respected people in China at the time. So, can you have a guess at what they began to do next? Yeah, that's right. Instead of wearing Buddhist monk clothing, they quickly changed costumes. This time, they began to wear the clothing of Confucian scholars. Now, th think of the, the handful Chinese robes with, the, with those really fancy caps, except they're being worn by white people. <laughs> uh. So, by doing this, they thought... By dressing up as a Confucian scholar, they could appeal to actual Chinese Confucian scholars who could relate to them because they were trying to be like them. And it did start to work. They did start building some rapport with the Confucian scholars. And it helped that, obviously, Matteo and Rigieri as well could speak Chinese. During their time in Zhao Qing, Matteo and Rigieri translated and compiled a Portuguese Chinese dictionary which was the first ever dictionary that translated the Chinese language with a European language. Matteo Ricci himself also created the first European-style world map in Chinese, and it was known as the Da Ying Quan Tu, and the map detailed all of the known world at the time, and this was an eye-opener for the Chinese, because when Chinese people looked at the map, they were fascinated. They thought, you know, they thought they were at the centre of the world, but it turns out they're not. There's so many other countries out there that they'd never even heard of, you know, outside of Asia. The unfortunate part is that this map actually has been lost. But you see what Matteo and Rigieri were doing? They were trying to build rapport, but not just trying to learn from the Confucian scholars, but they were trying to impart knowledge onto them as well, to try and attract Chinese people to, you know, understand and learn what they had. Like, let's say I was a Confucian scholar in China. I saw this map and I was like, whoa, what are these countries? Is Spain? What's Spain? Czech Republic? What's Czech Republic? And I would have been curious. Well, what the, how do you know these things? Well, what are these things? Tell me more. Tell me more about these, you know, s countries that are on this map. And then by doing so, by getting their attention, you start to build a sort of connection. And that's when you build relationships. That was the tact that Matteo Ricci and Rigieri were going for. But after a couple of years in Zhao Qing, Matteo Ricci was left all alone when Rigieri left China in the year 1588. So he was all by himself now, 
which meant it was up to him to complete the task of trying to convert Chinese people into Christianity. In the following year, in the year 1589, Matteo was kicked out of Chaoqing, but he didn't give up, and he moved to another city called Shaozhou, S-H-A-O-Z-H-O-U, which is the present-day city of Shaoguan in southern China. And gradually, he started to build relationships. It started to work, but it took a while. His Confucian clothing, his fluent Chinese, and knowledge of Chinese literature and the classics was gradually being noticed and welcomed by Chinese people. I mean, they were fascinated by this guy who not only knew Chinese culture, but knew cultures of a completely foreign country that they'd never heard of, and they wanted to know more. The knowledge of Confucian classics helped Matteo greatly, because that obviously appealed to the Confucian scholars and the upper class of China at the time, who were all Confucian fanatics. He started to travel to other Chinese cities as well to spread the word of European culture and Catholic Christianity. The cities he had travelled to included large cities like Nanjing and Nancheng, where he also set up headquarters there so he could use to spread the religion and knowledge that he had. And it wasn't just knowledge he was giving the Chinese people, he also had to give them things that he could see. Apart from that world map that he made, he also brought other gifts from Europe, like clocks, musical instruments, and funny-looking Christian statues that the Chinese would have been like, oh, that's a nice toy. But his ultimate goal, which he achieved in the year 1601, was that he was finally allowed to go to and live in the city of Beijing, which was at the time the capital city of the imperial Ming dynasty. And Beijing was his ultimate goal, because that was where the emperor was. Now, why was the emperor so important? You see, he believed that with China, influence to the common people came from the top. So he believed if he was able to reach the emperor and tell him about Christianity, and then somehow convert the emperor into Christianity, then if the emperor was all for Christianity, because he had ultimate power of the country, he could spread the religion to first the scholar officials below him, and then the people below them, and then finally the common people, therefore diffusing the religion to everyone in the country. So that was why getting an ear to the emperor was important for Matteo Ricci. Unfortunately, however, I'm going to say now that he actually never met the emperor during his entire time in China, but the emperor knew of him. Even though it was unfortunate he never got to meet the emperor, he was still a celebrity in Beijing. Everyone wanted to see this white guy who was wearing Chinese robes and speaking Chinese, but also speaking some other weird foreign language at the time. Italian. <laughs> and they also wanted to meet this guy because he had all these weird gifts, like he had all these weird items like clocks and violins and all these things that Chinese people hadn't even heard of. They wanted to meet this person, which was why he started to make a lot of friends. And Matteo Ricci was very welcoming. He taught his Chinese friends a lot of stuff they'd never heard about, which was mathematical and science knowledge that the Chinese people didn't know, showed them things like telescopes and world maps, and also taught them Western literature and philosophy. And it was through this exchange of culture and knowledge that helped Matteo eventually start converting Chinese people. This is where I'll get into two of Matteo Ricci's most famous students. His first student was a man named Chu Tai Su, spelled Q U T A I S U. Chu Tai Su had met Matteo Ricci in the city of Shaozhou in the year 1589. Chu Tai Su at the time was a Confucian scholar, and he was really hooked on to Matteo's knowledge of mathematics. So he became Matteo's first student and started to learn maths from Matteo Ricci. And in return for the knowledge, Chu Tai Su started introducing Matteo Ricci to a lot of his other Confucian friends, who were scholars, civil servants, and even military people. And this started to broaden Matteo Ricci's name, network, and knowledge of him around the country. But his second student was perhaps his most famous student, and his name. I'm sure a lot of people may already know this. His name was Xu Guangqi, 
Xu Guangqi, spelt X U G U A N G Q I. Xu Guangqi first met Matteo Ricci when Matteo was working in Nanjing trying to spread Christianity. Like Matteo Ricci, Xu Guangqi, he was also intelligent as well. As a young child, he was really smart and curious. For example, he passed the Kurdu exams as a Juren. If you don't know what that is, I suggest you tune into my episode about the Kurdu exams. It's episode six. And from a young age, Xu Guangqi was very interested in technology, and he spent lots and lots of time finding out new ways to develop new farming techniques and improve weaponry at the time. So when he saw someone like Matteo Ricci, who had all this knowledge that he had never heard about, he was really curious. He wanted to tap in to Matteo's brain. So Xu Guangqi became his student, and he began to study maths, astronomy, geography, amongst other things, under Matteo Ricci. And that wasn't all. Xu Guangqi and Matteo Ricci translated a lot of literature together. For example, Xu Guangqi translated the text "Elements" into Chinese. For those of you who don't know what "Elements" is, it's a mathematical text written by the famous ancient Greek mathematician Euclid. Euclid spelled E-U-C-L-I-D. And then at the same time, Matteo Ricci was translating Confucian texts from Chinese to Latin. It was said that every day, both of them would get up really early in the morning. Ugh. Then they'd have a morning discussion, and then Xu Guangqi would start translating based on Matteo Ricci's instructions. Now, having these texts translated was obviously very important for the exchange of knowledge between different cultures. By translating Euclid's mathematical text into Chinese, that would enable local Chinese people to learn about that they could now read, and likewise for Confucian texts. Now that they were in Latin, European people could study Chinese philosophy. But the most important thing that Matteo Ricci did to Xu Guangqi was that he successfully converted Xu Guangqi into Christianity, and it was such an overkill because Xu Guangqi. Not only became Catholic, but his whole family became Catholic as well, and their family are the oldest Catholics in China. In fact, Xu Guangqi's granddaughter was a really famous Catholic. Matteo Ricci did a lot of hard work in China, and his work set up a base for future missionaries to spread Christianity and Catholicism into China. A good example I have is he set up China's first. Catholic Church in the year 1605, the Catholic Church was called Xuan Wu Men Tian Zhu Tang, or in English Xuan Wu Men Church. Xuan Wu Men spelt X U A N W U M E N. The Xuan Wu Men Church is in Beijing, and when he founded it at the time, it was a small scale tiny chapel, which gradually over the years was developed into a larger church. Matteo Ricci set up a base in China, and he wanted to do more things, but sadly, in the year 1610, he died, aged 57, and was buried in Beijing. When everyone thinks of famous Italians in China, the first person everyone's going to think of is Marco Polo, even if he wasn't technically Italian. But Matteo Ricci often gets overlooked. In China, however, he's very famous. And his legacy lies in promoting cultural exchange between Chinese and Western culture. He was responsible for disseminating knowledge of science and technology into China. He translated many European texts into Chinese, and he gave Chinese people knowledge of the outside world. He also brought Chinese culture into Europe. For example, he was one of the first people that brought Confucianism into Europe. But when Matteo was in China, he was also very critical of Chinese culture as well, and he evidenced the decline of the Ming Dynasty. His critiques of Chinese culture were based on his observations of the Chinese people whilst he was there. You see, for centuries, China had been a leader in science and technology, but that ended during the Ming Dynasty when it finally began to lag behind the West. A good example is that when Matteo Ricci was in China, he had to tell Chinese people 
that the earth was round and not flat. And as I said earlier, it was a challenge for people like Matteo to teach Chinese people about foreign thoughts and ideas. And whenever he taught Chinese people about these ideas, the Chinese people's lack of knowledge of any of these things led Matteo to think that Chinese people were so self-centered and they thought they were the best in the world. So much so, they weren't willing to accept ideas from other countries. He also observed cultural superiority. In other words, my culture is better than your culture. Matteo Ricci was also very critical of the Ming tributary system at the time, which he believed fueled this cultural superiority. The tributary system was a system where other countries would give gifts to China and also say praise to China, saying that they were number one. And in return for them saying that, the Chinese emperor and the country would give these countries two, three, or even four times more gifts in return. So it wasn't really paying tribute at all. It was essentially paying off these other countries with more goods and gifts, just so they could hear the words, China, you are number one. Like, can you imagine? That's so fake. No wonder Matteo Ricci thought that, that the Chinese people were very vain and superficial in believing that they were number one and that they were better than everyone else. I mean, if you deal with people like that, how can these people ever learn and develop themselves if they believe that they are perfect already? It applies to countries and cultures as well. This sort of cultural superiority was fatal for China because it meant it was hard for Chinese people to learn new knowledge. Historian K.C. Shao said that if the Ming Dynasty had accepted and seriously studied the scientific knowledge that they had received from Matteo Ricci at the time, which included ideas and knowledge from people such as, you know, Copernicus and Columbus, then China's modernization would have been two to three centuries earlier than it actually was. I think an important takeaway from this episode is that respect and understanding is very important when making connections. Matteo Ricci wasn't successful at first because he just assumed that the European way worked with the Chinese way, because he didn't have any understanding about the Chinese people. But the reason why he was eventually able to succeed in promoting Catholicism in China, because he was finally willing to try to learn Chinese culture, their language, and their philosophy. And by doing so, he was able to gain the respect of the local Chinese scholars. And by doing so, he built relationships with them. And by doing so, they in turn were willing to accept and learn from him, which included European knowledge of science, technology, and religion. In December 2022, Pope Francis declared that Matteo Ricci had, quote, lived the Christian values to a heroic degree and was bestowed the title of Venerable. What does this mean? Well, by being declared Venerable, Matteo Ricci has now achieved stage three of a five-stage process of becoming a saint. For Matteo Ricci to actually become a saint, he will need to be beatified first. This means a miracle needs to happen when a prayer is made to Matteo Ricci. For example, let's say there was a blind person. If that blind person prayed to Matteo Ricci to be able to see again, and then they actually are able to see again, then that is considered a miracle. Then, after that first miracle is verified, a second miracle needs to happen again before the Pope can canonize Matteo Ricci for him to become a saint. So yeah, in short, if you're a Catholic who's listening, start praying to Matteo Ricci, and fingers crossed, you can make those miracles happen. So yeah, that's it. That's the end of the story of this great religious and cultural ambassador, Matteo Ricci. I hope you all enjoyed this episode. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to my podcast right now, and also follow me on my Instagram at Bamboo History Podcast. If you want to reach out to me with feedback, topic suggestions, or just want to have a chat, feel free to Instagram DM me or email me. Details will be in the description box below. Okay now, time to go. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Enjoy the rest of your day or evening, and I'll see you all next time on the Bamboo History Podcast. Bye for now. Arrivederci!